earth and there are all these knowledge crystals and I didn't like the series that much okay so don't frown at me you know, it's not that great a movie I'm just illustrating here uh, these knowledge crystals tell him all the known physics of this advanced civilization but the last and most precious crystal that he gets in the ship is symbolically important it says now that you know all this you know all these things you may want to know what is most important and that's who you are and so the last crystal is supposed to give him the Socratic style of knowledge. So Socrates believed, and this is a nice illustration, because Socrates believed that one could have all the other kind of knowledge and be totally lost, totally aimless, if one didn't have the other kind of knowledge, which was knowledge of oneself. And uh, this is nice to remember today, I think. It's a cautionary tale because we live today in a society saturated with information, just information, I, 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 which I would want to radically distinguish, distinguish from wisdom or knowledge, but just saturated with information. But I think in our society, the Socratic question is not only difficult to answer, but even a sense for its importance is being lost. We're just saturated with information we're told so frequently who we are, given a certain set of, uh, of roles that are prearranged, pre-established, and within which in a free society one is able to vary slightly. In other words, there, uh, to give you an example, we all know what a yuppie is, but we know within that category there's some variation possible. You could be sandy-haired or red-haired. You could wear a black Reeboks or white ones. I mean, you know, there's a little... But this is, I, I'm trying to give you a sense for the strange distance between, historical distance, between the Socratic search for wisdom and this kind of way of finding out who you are. It's very different, a very different thing. Okay, uh, let's see. Should I, should I finally throw in an argument? No, not yet. Uh, Socrates, uh, in, uh, in the dialogues, his primary antagonists are called the sophists. And the best historical analogy for the sophists, and, and I don't like to use the word the way most philosophers do, is pejorative, because the word sophist, uh, uh, they were simply folks who went around and they taught things. They taught how to do well in the marketplace, business school. They taught how to win your cases in the law court, law school. You know, they taught how to run the state well, public policy at Duke or wherever. So, you know, I mean, they went around and they got paid for doing this. In fact, it's interesting that at the trial of Socrates, his one defense that's really convincing that he's not a sophist is that he doesn't get paid to teach. Of course, under that rubric in our society, we're all sophists, right? Everybody in front of a podium at every university is a sophist whether they belong to the National Association of Scholars or not. They're still getting paid, and the presumption by at least some Greeks was that if you got paid to say something, it was, a, a, it was to be taken with a, a great deal of suspicion. So that was a defense of Socrates. Well, the sophists had a general view that backed it up that I think today, again, is a view that we can understand in our own time. Uh, uh, the the, the uh, sophist position uh, is stated variously by various sophists. I'm not going to run through the various ones. Uh, in, in most of the dialogues, uh, Socrates, will, his interlocutor will be one of them. In most of the Socratic dialogues, he'll be talking to one of these people. But uh, Protagoras is the best known sophist, and his view has, been, has come down and has become very famous, and it is, man is the measure of all things. Now, that is an ambiguous statement. It's one that Socrates wanted to point out the ambiguity in. Man is the measure of all things can be read in, in a modern ear that sounds like individuals, a constructed historical category, by the way, individuals are the locus of knowledge. And you've heard that argument, I'm sure, in regard to art, for example. Someone will say, well, you know, I, I don't know what art is, but I know what I like, and that's a knockdown argument in art, a lot of us think. Uh, you know, I happen to like Mel Gibson's Hamlet. You know, it's, it's weird, I like it, but, uh, and that's supposed to be a knockdown knock argument. 
On this argument by the sophists, though, knowledge is impossible because each individual will have, just like a nose, an opinion and a right to it. And no ones will be more right than the other. That's one way to understand his position. Another more sophisticated way to understand Protagoras is for him to be saying something like this. Each tribe or culture's standard of, standards of knowledge will be the standards that will hold for that tribe or that culture. That's a more sophisticated version of what some philosophers like to call relativism. Now, Socrates is a very peculiar person, and, and, this, and I'm, I'll connect this back up with human values in a minute, because Socrates won't accept either version of the relativist argument. And in our context, one would think that would make him a dogmatist. I mean, because we're all, I think, immersed in a culture of what I might call sophomoric relativism. By that I mean we go, well, that's my opinion, damn it. You know, sort of like intervie interviewing someone for USA Today. Well, that, that's what I think, damn it. You know, little nuke over Baghdad, damn it. You know, and, 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 and old Henry goes, well, that's old Bill's opinion. You know, it's, you know I, I, I respect that. And in a democracy, we're supposed to be democratic about knowledge, you know. Right? Well, everybody's got a right to be a damn fool. And, uh, and I'm not opposed to that necessarily. I just want to point out that, there, that that doesn't end debate, right? I mean, you can still argue with old Henry or old Harry or old Sam. or You can tell I've been in North Carolina too long from these names. <laughs> anyway, uh, Socrates' position was that the relativist had to be wrong, but it didn't follow from that that Socrates himself had to know the absolute truth. In other words, Socrates thought that he absolutely knew there must be some truths that were absolutely important for human beings without making the further claim that he knew what they were. See, the further claim is what I like to call the Jerry Falwell claim. I'm not a relativist. There are absolute truths, and by God I know them, where the by God is more than a mere, you know, uh, conjoining, I mean, it's really by God I know them. Well, Socrates held a position that was neither one of these. There must be absolute truths, but I myself don't possess them. Now, that gives the explanation, and I'm sure all of you have read a Socratic dialogue at one time or another. Most people have been forced to at one time or another, right? It's kind of peculiar, but most people have been forced to read one. And it's irritating to read this old man's questioning. We need to remember Socrates was very ugly, according to the bus, you know, of his face. Kind of like me, sort of short, fat, ugly, irritating person. <laughs> and as Nietzsche said, to be ugly in Greece was already an objection, <laughs> you know? And I mean, I guess that's where the modern word for Greeks comes from on university campuses, right? Because to show up ugly is already, you know, you're out. And, uh, so to be ugly in Greece was already an objection. Socrates is fat, ugly little guy. Uh, uh, as I say, had these, uh, had held this, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, engaged in this practice of questioning, and it's irritating to read them because you go, oh, well, those are just, those questions just run in circles. Have you ever got, any, got that feeling when you read them? It's just silly. You know? that, that's not getting anywhere. It's a kind of an American response, you know. What, what's he getting at, you know? When's he going to get around to it? Well, the Socratic procedure, the dialogues, may not be to get around to anything. Just the pure charm and beauty of the talk may itself contain a glimmer of truth or transcendence. It's not necessary in all the dialogues that he get to something. I mean, the, the power of thought just for its own autonomy and its own beauty might be something the Greeks were interested in, in conversation, for its own sake. We're a little too busy now for that kind of thing, but just for its own sake it might be interesting. So uh, Socrates held this position.